Windscale had met its target, delivering the tritium for the bomb. And so developing a weapon system um, which um, appeared to have um, a, a megaton yield was very important politically in this campaign of trying to reopen a collaboration with the, with the United States. But would Penny's H-bomb produce the magic megaton? It was an embarrassing failure. The blast was nowhere near a megaton. It was barely bigger than the atom bomb of five years earlier. But Penny had a backup plan, another bomb. It was called Orange Herald. I thought Orange Herald was a stupid device. It wasn't elegant. Uh, it, it couldn't be developed any further, a dead-end design, um, and it consumed an enormous amount of very expensive fissile material. It's not what I would have recommended, but I wasn't in charge. It wasn't an H-bomb at all, just a massive atom bomb they were convinced would produce a megaton. It needed huge quantities of plutonium and the magic ingredient, tritium. If you hoped to get a lot of big bangs, you need a lot of tritium. Uh, it was as simple as that. And so the demand for tritium on places like wind scale went up considerably. As the Orange Herald test approached, wind scale was suddenly ordered to increase production of the new material, tritium, by 500%. Five years before, the scientists had increased production for the atom bomb by removing some of the aluminium cartridge. To try to meet the demands for the H-bomb, new aluminium cartridges had been made to house the uranium and lithium magnesium. And once again, some of the aluminium casing was then removed to boost production by increasing the heat of the reaction. They also doubled the amount of lithium magnesium in the cartridges. But some expressed alarm at the danger of a nuclear accident. I would have said it was a reasonably green situation until the end of 55. I would have said it was orange in 56 and red from January the 1st, 57. It had put Windscale under even greater strain. But Orange Herald was ready for the watching media. When the flash comes, you see it round you, although you can't look at it. It sort of, every rivet on the ship sort of lights up, every bit of metal. And then after that, quite a long time after, you get the blast. So you see the thing very immediately. But you, you think, oh, well, it's all over, and suddenly you're hit by the blast. And it's very impressive. The government didn't tell the media Orange Herald wasn't an H-bomb. There was confusion, and politicians fudged things by talking sometimes about an H-bomb and sometimes about a megaton. Macmillan's spin worked. The press reported that Britain had produced a megaton H-bomb. They'd hoped for a megaton, they got 800,000 kilotons, but it was still a colossal blast. There's a lot of press coverage um, of, of those tests, which um, suggests that Britain has developed a, an H-bomb. There is no desire to put the record straight um, at this particular time, for largely political reasons. But the Americans weren't deceived into thinking Britain was now their equal. The scientists were trying to deliver. Um, they were disappointed uh, in the results. And so I think there must have been enormous anxiety in Whitehall at this time that maybe, given the pressures, um, we wouldn't be in a position quickly uh, to renew the collaboration, which was the great prize as far as Macmillan was concerned. Macmillan was undaunted. He ordered Penny to prepare another H-bomb test. But Windscale had already reached breaking point. The problem is that there was nobody to say no. 
Weeks after Orange Herald, Christopher Hinton, the man who led Winscale through so much, dramatically left. He was utterly upset towards the end of his stay with what had happened, and he sort of had a semi-nervous breakdown. Winscale had lost its bold, bad baron, just as the scientists were warning of impending disaster. But Macmillan's attention was elsewhere. A bolt from a clear blue Soviet sky. The Russians launched Sputnik, the world's first satellite. Suddenly, America was vulnerable to a Soviet attack. There was as much shock and fear uh, about Sputnik as the United States felt with 9-11. It was such a precision strike. I said, we should have been the first ones to have it, if there's such thing. It gets the American people alarmed that a foreign country, especially an enemy country, can do this, and it, we fear this. One small satellite orbiting the Earth, and yet a profound convulsion in American society as a result. Macmillan seized his chance. On the night of October the 10th, 1957, he wrote to Eisenhower, urging him to force Congress to accept Britain as America's nuclear ally. But even as he wrote, 300 miles north, events were unfolding which could steal the great prize, just as it was in his grasp. If you're a fatalist or believe, um, like the Greeks, in the malign influence of the gods, uh, you could point at that week and say, it, well, it was extraordinary that the very evening that my grandfather wrote to Ike, my dear friend, saying all the plans that he had, that very evening, the fire started at Winscale. Three days earlier, Vic Goodwin had turned up for his shift at the Winscale control room. The men monitoring the temperature gauges on the control panel had noticed that the reactor was heating up, more than it should. They ordered a Vigna release. This was the process they had come up with a few years earlier. Heating the graphite core had the effect of releasing any dangerous stored energy in the core. Once the energy was released, the graphite would eventually cool down. They'd done Vigna releases before, eight times. If the Vigna release worked, Goodwin would see the temperature rising all across the core, showing the stored energy was being released. Instead, the temperatures were falling when they should have been rising. The Vigna release hadn't removed the stored energy, except in one channel, 2053, which did appear to be releasing its stored energy. Unlike the rest, its temperature was rising. By early Tuesday morning, they faced a choice. Leaving the stored energy in the reactor wrist to fire, heating the reactor further, a second Vigna release, would raise the temperature of the core even higher. The experienced people decided that it would be necessary to warm it up again, uh, which had been done in the past. The second heating worked. The temperatures rose in all the channels, including 2053. The stored energy was being released. Now they had to make sure the temperatures didn't rise above the maximum allowed. As the temperatures rose, and on some thermocouples they were approaching 400 degrees centigrade, we allowed more air to flow through the core in order to control the temperatures. Windscale's air cooling system was turned on to cool the graphite core still further. But by Thursday morning, it was clear the reactor was behaving unpredictably. I was rather puzzled because some areas that, of the core, which had been cooling um, on Wednesday, were now heating up again. 